So one of the things I hope to do with my channel is to humanize some of the clarinet legends and myths that a lot of either misinformation or lore has passed around. And few names are as uh, mythologized in the last hundred years as Frank Casper. Uh, uh, and there are actually two different Frank Caspers, Frank L. Casper and his nephew, Frank Casper. I know, very confusing. Um, so my first teacher was a student of Bonad. And he very early got me to listen to the Robert Marcellus, George Sell, Mozart concerto. Um, and I, I, doing some research, quickly found out he was using a Casper mouthpiece, and I always wanted one. Well, my family moved down to Florida, and my teacher uh, got, was playing a, a Casper Chicago mouthpiece. And he sounded great. And I talked to him about Marcellus, and he said, you got to also listen to Harold Wright. He was pretty good, too. And my teacher played double lip embouchure, which is interesting, uh, interesting combination. Uh, but what he also said is actually, the real reason why this mouthpiece sounds good is, is it was refaced by Everett Matson. And I had not heard of that name, but he said actually, Robert Marcellus and Harold Wrights, uh, both of them played mouthpieces that were refaced by Everett Matson. Uh, well, and doing some research, I, I, I found that, well, just about everybody had mouthpieces worked on by and revoiced by Mr. Matson. So, searching around, I found a couple uh, mouthpieces, Casper mouthpieces, refaced by Matson and put away. Um, because facings do tend to wear over time. Um, and um, this is a Frank L. Casper Ann Arbor mouthpiece refaced by Everett Matson. This has such incredible projection, um, and this plays to be more like what I expect the Shedvel to play like than what I expect the Casper to play like. Well, what does that mean? Um, I, I think the greatest examples of clarinet articulation um, are, you know, Harold Wright, Stanley Drucker, Robert Marcellus. Um, again, all three work done by Everett Matson. The way this response is just like, unlike anything I've really ever played. Let me compare this to an original facing. Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor, Casper. I went crazy and I bought mm, probably 20 or 25 Casper mouthpieces for everything. B-flat, E-flat clarinet, bass clarinet, alto tenor saxophone, soprano saxophone. show you what that plays like with the V12 I was playing with the first mouthpiece. Doesn't work at all. So about five years ago, my friend showed me uh, uh, he, that he found a, a Casper, Frank L. Casper, an Arbor mouthpiece. And um, at the time I was playing an M14. That's all I had played for about 11 years. Um, and I tried everything, but that M14 was just right for me. The facing was perfect. And what I immediately noticed when I tried this original facing, Frank L. Casper and Arbor mouthpiece, was the facing really wasn't good for me. And yet, I could still get this beautifully resonant halo of sound, beautiful overtones, very warm sound. And I found it very attractive. So the next day, I... I, I, I was teaching privately, and I, I, I went to teach, and I went into my studio, and I put on my M14, and I played a little bit, and I got the worst headache of my entire life. I had to quit teaching that day, went home, lied down, got better after a few hours. The next day, same thing happened. I put on my M14, and I had the worst headache of my life. 
And I realized that there was something in the Vendoran compared to that new world that I experienced with the Casper mouthpiece that was causing a, a massive pressure differential between the two mouthpieces, uh, between what I was experiencing um, with my soft palate, um, uh, with my neck muscles, and, and for whatever reason, I was getting a headache when I was playing the Van Doren. So I was left with this impossible choice, a perfect facing and migraines, or the worst facing ever, but no migraine and beautiful resonance. Um, and so I went crazy and I, and I bought a whole bunch of Casper mouthpieces. Um, and what I realized one day I was playing an E flat Casper mouthpiece. Um, and I realized that it played a lot like B flat. And I thought, wait, wait a second. And it sounded like B flat. And then I, I, I said, wait a second. I put on a Frank Casper alto sax mouthpiece and it played a lot like tenor sax. And I said, wait a second. Casper mouthpieces on B-flat clarinet make B-flat sound like A clarinet, or make A clarinet sound like Bassett clarinet. And that's part of the reason why the Marcellus Mozart is so universally loved, because the tone sounds a bit like, a bit more like the Bassett horn that Mozart envisioned and, and, and wrote for. That's, that's crazy. Um, well, Eventually, I kind of moved away from Caspers. Um, uh, 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 that same year that I bought 20 Caspers, like I say, in one year, I found, um, my friend found me this. This is a Mellophone mouthpiece, and it has a signature by Eugene Bersou. Eugene Bersou was associated with the Shed Bells. Um, and we think this mouthpiece is like early 1920s or even earlier. And this thing reminded me a lot of the Caspar sound, but bigger and more and just easier. <laughs> facing Casper mouthpiece. Um, probably handmade by or, or hand faced by either Eugene Bersou or someone in the United States. Um, so I realized that part of what what makes Casper so um, attractive is they have the American sound. Uh, bigger, broader, slightly more more open sound. Um, and um, and also you think about Chicago has a large German influence in Chicago Symphony, uh, Lindemann, and um, so Casper still pop up all the time on eBay, less than they did a few years ago, like five years ago. Um, they are some of the most inconsistent mouthpieces I've ever played. Um, no two, in terms of facing, play the same. Doesn't matter what number they say. Um, the earliest ones, uh, say Goldbeck. Goldbeck is who the elder Casper went to go work for in Chicago. Um, those are the most Caspar-esque, in my opinion. Um, in terms of the way they, 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 uh, they did the internals of the mouthpiece, I believe it decreases back pressure. And this is part of the reason why Caspers are so popular amongst saxophonists and doublers and Broadway players. Because it makes it easy to double, because by making the instrument feel a little bit bigger, it's a little bit less back pressure, it feels more free. You need less precision. And I notice a lot less on the original facing Casper. If I use an E tongue position versus an A tongue position, check this out. This is super cool. Uh, 
2725. That's the patent of the early shed blanks. This is the same blank that an early Henri Shedvel would have been worked on. And I have an Henri Shedvel that has the same blank. E. A. Nope. Hmm. So, I mean, in terms of that, the Matson Casper and the original Casper couldn't be more different uh, in the type of reads they like. And I think part of it is um, Casper, uh, a lot of people like Caspers with more ray reads, which are very different than, than, than what we use today. Um, whereas the French reads that the Shedvels uh, used are, are, I guess, they're just they're more similar to what we use today. Because there's a number of original facing Shedvels that I I play professionally, uh, even for E flat clarinet, original facing work great. Um, the story I heard of how Robert Marcellus got his first Casper is, is he was at a, um, a, a like a musical gig, and somebody knocked over his Shedvel, his Bonad Melior Shedvel, and it broke. But the saxophone player said, "Hey, try my, um, try my." Casper mouthpiece, and he loved it, and he recommended all the students get it. That's part of where the mystique came from, and there was a way of voicing those Caspers, um, especially those early ones, Chicago Caspers, they were made for bigger bore horns, like Selmer's, and there was a way of voicing them that, again, it, it's, it's less precise in your tongue position, it's more amenable when you're switching back and forth between saxophone and clarinet. Um, but also the way they project because of the voicing, that's the one thing that's consistent between Goldbeck, Casper Chicago, Casper Cicero, Casper Ann Arbor. Um, it's, there's something in the voicing that is very consistent there and, and allows for the best projection. In my opinion, I've played some great Chicago's, some great Cicero's, but I think Ann Arbor's get a bad rap. And in, in my opinion, the best one I played is that Maps in Ann Arbor. That's the only one I've kept. I've sold every other Casper mouthpiece I've, I've owned or that have come through my hands. Um, I think they're great, and they were made more for Arthur Keynes. The Casper was just made for what was popular at the time. In the 40s, Selmer's were popular. Later on, later Cicero's um, were made for Arthur Keynes, made for buffets. Um, one more thing I want to say. People say that part of the reason why Casper's are great is the blanks. Well, this Madsen is a Babbitt blank. The real genius is both Caspers, Elder, Frank L, Younger, Frank Casper, both of them used many different blanks and yet were able to voice them to create a consistent voice and consistent identity. Um, that other original facing Ann Arbor is a Shedville. So it's a myth that all Ann Arbors are Babbitts, only the later ones are, and the later Cicero's are also Babbitts. Um, the early Chicago's generally are always shed belts. And, and they can be great mouthpieces, but again, I feel for the modern tastes uh, that, we, that we expect today, just about any Casper needs work. The problem is very few refacers know how to properly voice Caspers. So it's kind of a catch-22. And they're very unique mouthpieces. Just because I tend to prefer more of a shed valve or early Selmer mouthpiece, um, these are still, in a connoisseur level, these are still obviously some of the greatest mouthpieces of all time. There's a special way that they tune and create so many overtones that the way they, they tune is very easy. You just slot in 
with someone else. With, with shed bells, you center the tone. Casper's, you just get a mass of, of tone. And it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. Um, uh, the way they, again, the, the biggest problem with them is just their facings, especially the Ann Arbor facings, are not that great. Um, and I don't know if I've ever played a really great original facing Ann Arbor. Um, um, I think that um, they make great bass clarinet mouthpieces. They make great E flat mouthpieces. Um, it's just, remember, there were many, many, many other great American um, mouthpiece, uh, you know, Bettany, Shed Bells, um, Pine, um, and Henri Leroy, who was principal of New York Phil, who made mouthpieces, uh, who took over the Robert factory, he made mouthpieces that are somewhat Caspar-esque. I know a great musician that plays Henri Leroy mouthpieces who also really likes Caspar mouthpieces. So that's interesting. Um, it's amazing how much the Caspar mouthpiece has identified modern clarinet sound, how much Marcellus in his recording changed a lot of tastes of, of what we expect a clarinet to sound like. And yet, the great irony is, you can't, uh, very few people can successfully play one today. And especially for younger players, it's very foreign than what we expect a clarinet mouthpiece to feel like. And and, and the way they project is, is just so foreign. It's like you're speaking a different language when you play a Casper. Um, and again, there are, there, are, there are many, many great texts today that make copies of, of Casper's, but you kind of have to play an original to really appreciate how, how good of a job they do in, in recapturing their, their, their essence. Um, who do I recommend Casper's for? People who have trouble with back pressure. Doublers, bass clarinets especially, I think, would love to play a Casper on B-flat clarinet. Um, also, the way, the way you articulate, um, I, I feel, is a bit more forgiving on, on a Casper. Um, I'll leave you with a quote by Robert Marcellus. He said, shed bells are the blue bloods, or the royalty of clarinet, but the Caspers are the working man's mouthpiece. And I think up through the 90s, there were several decades where the most popular mouthpieces, most most prolifically used in American orchestras were the Casper mouthpieces.